Welcome to Psych Sessions on Teaching and Learning Centers. My name is Chris Hakala, and I'm your podcast host. In this series of conversations, we speak with folks who have made the leap from a traditional faculty member position to a role in a center for teaching and learning. The conversations focus on how individuals moved from faculty to a center and how that move impacted their work, their career trajectory, and their personal and professional identity. Along the way, we talk about tips, advice, and challenges that come from working in a center. Sit back and enjoy these chats on Psych Sessions on Teaching and Learning Centers. I'm here with Jim Lang today to talk about uh, teaching center uh, work and the kind of work that he has done at his institution and some of the work that uh, he has shared with others through some of his publications. Jim, thanks for coming today and for, for talking to me. You bet. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, so, Jim, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with uh, a little bit of background, and I'd love to hear your pathway because you're someone who comes out of English. You don't come out of psychology, which uh, a number of people I've spoken with have come out of psychology. You've taken a bit of a non-traditional path compared to other academics. So I'd love to hear how you moved from a professor of English, and I know you do English literature, uh, British literature in particular, to uh, where you were running the center. Yeah, so my path actually started way back in graduate school. When I was getting my PhD in English at Northwestern, um, I just was looking for part-time work to help sort of supplement my, you know, (laughs) meager graduate stipend. And uh, there was a job, part-time job opening at the Center for Teaching Excellence at Northwestern at that time, which was being run by Ken Bain. And so Ken um, invited me. uh, So I had applied for that job and and, uh, got a part-time job working with Ken there. And my job was to kind of like help develop programming for graduate students. And um, one of the first things that Ken did when I got to the center was sort of point me to the bookcases and file cabinets and say, you know, take some time and like read, like learn a little bit about teaching and learning in higher education, what the literature says. And um, so I got interested in that and I, I found it fascinating and I was teaching at the time. So it was really interesting for me to, to read about teaching techniques and, and then try them out in my own class. And I was particularly interested in uh, that what the literature said on how to uh, have good discussions with students, because I, I wanted to teach by discussion, but it wasn't always successful. And then I, you know, discovered, well, there's all these uh, sort of articles and books about how to teach by discussion. <laughs> Peter Frederick's uh, The Dreaded Discussion, 10 Ways to Start, was like the first thing that really captured my attention, uh-huh. a practical kind of set of things that you could do, which just sort of opened my mind. Like, oh, so, you know, you can do something other than just walk in and ask questions. Like there's these things that you can do. So anyway, so I did that for a year as a graduate student. Then I got my degree and um, a position opened up there as an as the assistant director. And we liked Chicago. We wanted to stay mm-hmm. so that position, did that for three years. But then, you know, there was this sort of irony that I was writing about teaching and thinking about it and talking about it to other people, but I wasn't really teaching that much myself. Uh huh. So I decided that I wanted to go out and apply for regular jobs in, in my field, which I did. So I got a job as an English professor and kind of went through the usual movements of uh, moving up the ranks as an English professor um, and did that for 13 years mm-hmm. uh, until my second sabbatical. Um, I uh, kind of launched, made had made the plans for a few years. Actually, we had made plans for a few years to try to start a teaching center on campus. And I was working with the people to do that. We had proposed it, but the administration just sort of wouldn't pull the trigger on it. Um, and finally, in 2013, they agreed to um, fund the center and, and uh, they appointed me director. And that's kind of how it started. So for then for, um, you know, from that point forward, I was both still as I had a basically half time appointment in both places. So I okay. was still teaching one or two courses per semester in the English department. But then I was using the rest of my time um, on a seven course load over the course of a whole year. So I basically three to four courses, uh, course loads, uh, either for teaching or for the work that I was doing directing the center. Uh, I've since discovered, you know, I always say, well, my path is kind of quirky, but a lot of these paths, (laughs) almost everyone I know who's ended up in a teaching center, the path has been quirky. Yeah, it's really interesting. And the thing that that I, I, I really like what you said about you were talking about teaching without teaching. I want to dig into that a little bit. There are some people who believe that you don't need to be teaching and running a teaching center. And I have, I have opinions about that, but I'd be curious because it seemed like uh, what you just said is, is counter to that. But I'd be curious what your thoughts are now that you've been doing this for a few years. 
Yeah, I do believe it's important to keep teaching because there are things that arise from your encounters in the classroom that, you know, you just might not realize are, are going on. Like as students come into your classes with different kinds of experiences, um, as different things are like emerging from, um, you know, like maybe changes in, in the kinds of students that you're getting on campus, for example, um, you just, you don't, you won't, you won't know those things. You won't have that sort of grounded experience. Um, you know, this literally just happened to me uh, this week. I, I was, um, I just posted something on Twitter about this, that I was talking to my students about we're reading a novel in class and it's, it's kind of a slow moving novel and very subtle and everything. So I was saying, why are you having trouble staying focused on it? And they, several of them said, well, you know what I do is I actually listen to it while I read it. So like I listen to the audio version and I read it at the same time. Mm -hmm. I was like, I never would have known, thought of that or known that students do that. And now it's like spurred a whole thing. I'm going to do, you know, do a whole thing in class today about, you know, reading aloud and thinking about that. And well, how does that change our understanding of the book? So like the, a lot of my ideas about teaching, a lot of the things that I, um, the problems and issues that I want to address come from my own experiences in the classroom. And I don't think I would know about a lot of those things if I wasn't in the classroom. Yeah, it was a lot of things that you just said that I think are really interesting. And I think that that's absolutely true. I know that for me, a lot of my ideas and thoughts for activities come from experiences I've had in class where things haven't gone quite as well as I'd like them to. Right. Um, exactly. and, and I think uh, the students have pointed me in ways, uh, uh, they say things such as that activity right there we didn't know where to go. So it helps me understand the clarity of my instructions. And I think that's been really helpful. But back to your point about the listening and reading, just as sort of an aside, I've collected data on comprehension as a function of reading versus listening. And it's really mm. interesting because I think that combining the two really is a valuable opportunity for students, in particular students who have not spent a lot of time in narrative text. So yeah. I, think that, I think that's really an interesting process that you're going through. I encourage my students when they read novels if they don't read novels very often to start with that to give them some simple pacing some uh, ability to think through some of these things and to be able to pause and go back so i think it's really interesting that your students brought that up i didn't know it was sort of a trend among students but that that is kind of yeah kind yeah of interesting. yeah the other thing i'll say about the, this relationship between the classroom and sort of the faculty development thing is you know i, I in my writing about teaching and learning i've taken kind of a problem-based approach so like uh -huh. You know, like, so where are the problems that we encounter in the classroom? And then what can we learn from those problems about how to teach people more effectively? And so, you know, two of my last three books take that approach, uh, Cheating Lessons and Distracted. Uh -huh. Those things would not have happened if I had not been in the classroom, right? So the cheating book really, one of the core sort of like originated experiences of that book was having a student who was going to be a teacher, who was a good student and, and worked hard, and yet plagiarized a paper. And I just mm -hmm. thinking about like, why did this happen? Like what? And eventually realized part of it was my assignment. And that mm -hmm. led to this whole kind of way of then thinking about cheating and trying to approach it from a teaching and learning perspective. And likewise, the distracted book emerged from my experience of just realizing that students were struggling in class and like seeing it, mm -hmm. seeing the fact that students were struggling with focus in class. And so then that made me think as well, okay, well, wait, what am I doing up here that's helping or not helping? So um, I, I really believe in a kind of problem-based approach to faculty development. And um, those problems are most visible when you are in the classroom with students. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And both of those issues that you brought up are really topical right now and in ways even different since the pandemic. And I, and I, 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 I guess one of the things that struck me this morning in my class was how the masks have an impact on how I am able to judge whether or not my students are completely engaged in the content. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It's much harder to tell. It's much harder to tell. And I'm looking at my class and I asked them and, and at the end of class, I had students come up and say, well, I really enjoyed that conversation. And I thought you could knock me over with a feather because I did not see any of that on your faces because I can't see their faces. So I think yeah. as, as things are evolving, it, it's continuing to change. And I, the point you brought up, is really powerful for me and one that has been a theme throughout a lot of these, these conversations that I've had with other people. And that is that by being involved in a teaching and learning center and staying connected with teaching and learning, however you do, I believe teaching is the most important way, but other people have other opinions. You see the evolution of this. It's not a static field. And, right. and there, are, there are a lot of people who have made the claim that we need to have a professionalization of 
teaching center faculty so that they get a degree that is geared towards being a center director. And I, I have, I have very mixed feelings about that. I do think there's a literature you need to learn, but I also think the benefit and the richness of our field comes from having people from all these different disciplines. Um, yeah, we probably need both. We probably need both of those perspectives, yeah. maybe ultimately. Um, you know, and just to give one more little example on this, about um, the, the the other thing that I have found oftentimes is that I often will read about like a really good and interesting teaching strategy. Mm-hmm. And th- that's really cool. And I, I want to recommend it to other people. But then I try it in my classroom and it's like, oh, wait a minute. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is exactly how I thought. Or if is this, if you you need to do these other three things in order to make it work. Like the person that presented it maybe didn't give you quite enough information that you have to try it on the ground. So I never feel comfortable recommending things to people unless I have sort of road tested them myself. Um, And the classroom is the place to road test them. Yeah. And I think that, that you bring up this other important issue and that is these activities and these, these teaching strategies are really part of an ecosystem and that ecosystem involves the instructor and the content and the, the, the students and, and what the students' goals are for that class. And, and it doesn't always work the way that you think. Um, I had a faculty member say to me, I heard once that being funny is the key. And I said that it, you know, being funny helps if you're funny. If you're not funny, it doesn't <laughs> help at all. And you right. really need to be aware of those kinds of things. And I right. think you're right. You road test this stuff in the classroom and you get to see how it works. So uh, that, that's all. That's really interesting information, Jim. And I'm really um, appreciative to talk to you about some of these things, including some of the books that you did, because I think as the field goes on, the problem-based approach where we take a look at what's currently going on in the field and how to address that is really the way for us to go, in particular, given that higher ed is under such a weird uh, squeeze right now. Um, You and I are both in the Northeast, and we've both heard about the declining population in the Northeast. We see schools closing. And we just need to be more effective in our classrooms to maintain the, the, the kinds of institutions that we want to be a part of. So I think that that's really important information. And I just want to clarify, too, when you said you landed your first job, and this is going back a little bit in the conversation, but I want to make sure you, you've been at Assumption as a faculty member your entire career. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Yep. So, and the reason I bring that up is that uh, as you went from full-time professor in English, and then you went to center director, did that have an impact on the way you were perceived by your colleagues, both at the institution or um, outside of the institution? I mean, what, what was that, that uh, transition like? Um, I mean, I had been at Assumption for 13 years, and I had served on a lot of committees and done all that kind of usual service work. So most people knew me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, and uh, of course, I had sort of been publicly writing about teaching for, quite, for a while through the Chronicle of Higher Education and actually um, had, had a couple books at that point. So, um, it, most people knew me and like, I think had sort of relative goodwill toward the founding of the center in my case. And it wasn't that much of a shift for me because I'd already been involved in, um, a faculty colloquium, which was sort of a regular thing that we did very informally to talk about teaching with our colleagues. So there wasn't that much of a difference in terms of, um, how my colleagues perceived me. Um, I think that over time, you know, I really tried to position the center um, and this was my always thing that I would say to people about the center is um, we argue about a lot as faculty members, not mm-hmm. just on our campus, but everywhere, right? We like oh, yeah. to argue and disagree about things and everything. But the teaching center is the one place where we can all come together and like agree on something, which is we're trying to do our best for our students. So like this is a place I hope of like um, community and um, where we all feel a shared sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. Like every event is just sort of let's come together and figure out how we can do this or like what are the implications of this and, and how can we make sure that we're doing um, doing the best possible work for our students. So um, I think that 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 that, that resonated pe- well with people. And so the, the, the teaching center was a place where people felt um, I only wanted people to come there and feel kind of positive. Mm-hmm. You know, vibes and positive, um, a positive sense of community with one another and with the mission of the institution. And even if people, you know, I teach at a Catholic, at a Catholic university, not every, all faculty members are sort of, you know, fully uh, have the same level re- like relationship with that mission. But again, that's at the teaching center. We all agree. We want to, we want to do the best for our students. So this is a place where kind of, we can all join together. So I think that, 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 that sat pretty well with people and, and as, built up a lot of goodwill for the teaching center. 
Well, and, and that's great. And it's a, it's a really nice way to think about it. And, and similar to some of the things I say to faculty all the time is that we, it's a, a, our moral and ethical responsibility to try to do the best we can for our students. And by coming together, we can share these ideas and, and share what we're trying to do. I think that's, that's, it's a nice ethos for a center to have. Um, can you describe one or two of the big uh, services your center offered and how it uh, reached faculty, what kind of reach you had across the campus? My two favorite things that we did were um, we had a book group um, every semester. So I would, uh, and the, the associate director and I would select a book um, that we thought was worth everyone reading. Or in a few cases, it was a shorter document, but usually it was a book. We would give that out prior to the break. So either in May or in December um, to anyone that was interested. And then we would have a dinner early in the next semester with a discussion of the book and sometimes like, like some structured activities to get people to engage with it. And we would get as many as 40 to 50 people at those events out of a full-time faculty of like 120. I think it was the free book and the dinner. Yeah, that helped. yeah, that's great. That's great. But still, you know, people really enjoyed, you know, having an opportunity to read one, you know, and we tried to keep them relatively short and mm -hmm. uh, not too heavy on jargon. So uh, just kind of a thought-provoking book on teaching. So that was a great event um, and, you know, really um, engaged a lot of people over the um, course of the year. Then the other was the Course Innovation Academy. So that was like um, a thing for eight faculty members each year. Uh, we had monthly meetings. We also, we would read a couple books, but then we would have a lot of shorter readings along the way. And it was like a seminar. And so each, each meeting would in, have some reading. Then they would post a discussion uh, board response to the reading. And then we would uh, meet for two hours and again, do kind of discussion and some structured activities. And then also they were all linked to, to observe one another's teaching. So each oh. they were put into pairs and they observed each other teaching mm -hmm. uh, as a part of that academy. So I that we took a break from when I went on sabbatical last year, but we did that five times, five years in a row, which meant 40 faculty members out of a full-time faculty of around 120 people went through it. So that was like, as far as I was concerned, that was the best way to kind of get people really engaged and then kind of have this ripple effect out through the faculty. Yeah. I mean, it's almost as if you were running a course through the center for. Exactly. Faculty. Exactly. Yeah. And as, and that actually that course counted sort of as one of my courses in terms of my course load. Yeah. That's, that's terrific. And I think that as you, as you talk about it, the, the impact factor of the number of faculty that you have on campus and how many you were able to reach is really powerful because one of the criticisms that centers get is that they don't reach the entire faculty. They don't reach enough people. And then you have to look at the value of the center and, and, and what it does. And it sounds like your center did a really nice job of, of, of doing that. Uh, and that's great. I think part of what uh, makes it is that ethos you had before. And that is, this is an opportunity to come together and talk about something we're all sharing. And exactly. uh, yeah. Yes. And to be collegial, you know, it was, there was a very sort of strong sense of collegiality um, at these events. And of course, you know, I should, that, that's not to say that we don't disagree about things in terms of how we teach. You know, we had, we did one of our big events about lecturing. I mean, people obviously have different opinions about that, but that's okay. Like it's okay to mm -hmm. disagree about the methods. We all have the share. If you have this shared sense of purpose, um, those kinds of disagreements about method can be really, you know, illuminating and interesting. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. So as you described earlier, you approached the administration several times about starting a center and eventually they, they allowed you to, and they gave you some funding and all of that. Um, what advice would you give someone who is at an institution that doesn't have a center or has an institution that has a, a very young center and they want to move into this field? What sorts of things would you recommend faculty members to do? Because as you said before, we all come from different paths. There's lots of people out there who are looking at this world and thinking, maybe I want to go that down that route. I mean, for faculty members who are interested, you know, the, the, our center started because the idea and the proposal for the center emerged from a, like an existing informal group of faculty members who met um, two or three times a semester. It was called the Faculty Colloquium, and they would just pick a topic and maybe have a short reading or something, mm -hmm. and then like get together in a, a room on campus um, and just have a discussion about it. And so, you know, I mean, sometimes centers come from administrative um, you know, sort of from, from the top. And mm -hmm. in fact, one of the reasons that we ultimately got our center was because our accreditation, our creditors essentially said, you need to do more in terms of faculty development and, uh -huh. and teaching center is one way to do that. So, so that certainly helped. Um, mm -hmm. so case that I've been making for the past several years, 
But, um, you know, to try to sort of think about, um, even if that happens, it's still for us to try and grow it organically from the faculty, right? So you want to identify um, the faculty members who are, who are already really interested and engaged maybe with the literature on teaching and learning. Um, and then, you know, to try to form connections with those people. And then if you don't have a center yet, um, you know, if you get a, a good, you know, number of people who are, who believe that this is important and who can make the case for it, that's probably the best way for um, a center, center to kind of um, get started on a campus in terms of growing like a, a newer center. Again, you know, I just encourage people to go slow, um, try to gradually, you know, add things as you see needs, you know, listen to people. Um, I never got around to this, but it was, a, I always had it as my plans to go around to like meet every chair. Um, and I still think it was a good, a good idea that I should have done, um, go around to meet every chair, you know, in my first, in the first year of the center and just say, you know, what does your department need? What are the um, issues that you see arising in your department? So that kind of like listening tour. Um, and, you know, those are the, the things that I, I, I'm, we tried a lot of stuff in, my, in the early years of the center before we sort of gradually landed on the things that we knew really worked. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in retrospect, probably we could have just, you know, grown more gradually and just sort of added things very slowly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that too, you don't want to overwhelm people. I was just actually talking to another center director um, a few days ago, and she was saying, uh, you know, the administration wants us to be doing programming once a week or something like that. Mm-hmm. This is like a new center. And I was like, all right, well, you know, you got to be realistic about this. Can you, can, are you going to suddenly have faculty members who now have room that, you know, for, for one event per week that they were where they weren't doing anything before? Like, mm-hmm. Actually, they're incredibly busy. Um, so, so, you know, start slow and gradual and just sort of kind of work your way out as you, as you identify the needs. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, this is really great advice. And it's one of those things that I think there's a lot of factors that come together, including the administration, as you said, they want to see activity. The faculty uh, can be resistant. They might, I mean, we have 204 faculty on our campus and we range in numbers of events uh, because of exactly what you said. People are busy. They have lots going on. And so you have to try to fit within their world in a way that makes sense. And I think that as you described it, starting slow makes a lot of sense because otherwise the overwhelming factor of everything coming at you uh, makes faculty resistant. They feel as though it it has become now a mandate rather than uh, an activity where they can go and share their ideas. So so I I think that's great advice. And I think that one of the real perks that Assumption had for years with you there, Jim, is that you were one of those people who contributed to the literature. And so I'll ask one last sort of thought is how much of an engagement do you believe a center director or center employees ought to have with the literature in terms of contribution? I know that you people want to read it, but, but how do you feel about people's... So, so I guess the question I'm asking is, should they fall under the same kinds of... Uh, 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 guidelines faculty do with regard to staying uh, not just adept in their discipline, but producing in their discipline? That's a really good question. I mean, it definitely helped me because, but I mean, that is a part because I sort of process things through my writing. So like if I encounter a problem or something difficult, the, the way I figure out how to address it is, is by writing about it. And mm-hmm. I, maybe not everybody does that or thinks along that way. Um, so, you know, I don't know, Chris, that's a good question. I, I do feel like centers can be the other. So I, I always had kind of two conceptions of big conceptions of the center. One was the one I've already shared with you about the, um, the place of community. The other was the center is a place that sort of takes all that scholarship of teaching and learning and new ideas that are out there in the world and then mm-hmm. funnels it down and shares it with faculty. So like uh-huh. I'm kind of like a curator, right, of resources that are coming from outside the campus that my faculty don't have the time to engage with. Like that's mm-hmm. my is to see like what's happening out in the world of teaching and learning, curate the resources, the, the, the people, the ideas that I think they should engage with and give them these kinds of limited exposure to it. But then if they want, they can go, they can go, you know, have deep exposure if they choose to. So my, my goal, my role is really to expose them to the things that I think are important um, going on in the world. So having said that, like, I think you could probably do an equally good job as a curator um, without producing mm-hmm. um, but I, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't really thought about that much. What's your take on it? Yeah, I'm not sure either. I mean, what you just described are two of the four structures of centers that pod has in their matrix. 
And I think about this a lot because as a center director, I, I'm still doing some writing. I'm still doing some of the, the, the work. But the curation part is really an important part of what I do with regard to helping, as you said, the faculty who don't have the time to read the literature. So I think it, it becomes a, a more challenging role depending on the size of your center, too, because you can have different people who sort of navigate different things. Um, it's a question that I, I, I don't have a great answer for, but I'm always curious what people think about it, because as time goes on, center directors are going to want some of the same, I believe, some of the same rights and responsibilities as faculty. The way librarians used to have faculty status, yeah. I think there's going to be this, this, this interesting shift. And, and so, and I, I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know, but I think it's an interesting conversation for uh, colleagues to engage in. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I, I think it's, it's one of those topics that uh, I think is going to be open for a little while. Is, and, and, and really, if you look at the last 20 years, centers have cropped up all over the place, including oh, yeah. institutions our size, which where they didn't exist before. So I think there's going to be a, a, a little bit more of this bubble exploding, and then it'll be some settling down, and, and things will, will become a little bit more standardized. But I don't know. It's 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 an exciting time to be in the field to see this stuff happen. So well, it's definitely there's it's definitely a growth field. It's one of the, one of the small numbers of really sort of growth fields in higher education right now. Oh, I know. Um, yeah, and we need it. You know, as our students are continually changing and we're learning new things about learning, we need people and places that can kind of keep on top of all that and then translate it and curate it for faculty. Well, Jim, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. This was really uh, uh, a wonderful conversation. And uh, I just want to thank you. And uh, hopefully um, our listeners are also appreciative of this. And I will uh, be hopeful to run into you again. All right. Thanks, Chris. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks.